everyone. Check, check. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to be talking about ransomware today um, and uh, specifically attacks on small businesses. Uh, my name is Rich Gatz. I'm a vice president, head of cyber claims at Arch Insurance. Uh, it's one of the top five cyber insurance companies in the United States. Um, I'm also an attorney with a background in data privacy and technology related matters. I'm Luke Agrippa. I'm a software engineer and researcher at Coalition, where we also sell cyber insurance. Uh, my day to day is analyzing security vulnerabilities in software to see how they'll affect our policyholders, as well as building uh, insurance applications with large language models. Hi, I'm William Buddington. Um, I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, based in SF. Um, we uh, use technology and law to make the internet a better place in terms of security and privacy. Uh, I also work on doing security and uh, privacy audits of, of apps uh, via reverse engineering and uh, dynamic analysis. Thanks. Um, so gonna be a pretty easy going session. So if anyone has any questions, what you can do is you can walk up to that mic with the green tape right there, and we can just answer them ad hoc, right? So we don't, you don't need to wait till the end of the presentation or a panel conversation to like ask a question. Um, but I think uh, the gentleman in the yellow coat is going to describe what ransomware is in case no one knows what that is, and then we can kind of go from there. Sure. Uh, ransomware is a result of malware, and malware is a, is a subset of malware. And malware is software that you don't want running on your machine, uh, does it so without your consent. And uh, often malware, I mean, for ransomware, uh, will encrypt your uh, files in a way that you yourself cannot decrypt them. Uh, and will request a uh, fee often in cryptocurrency because of its anonymous properties um, to decrypt the information. Uh, these can be you know, sensitive files, uh, can be on any range of devices, can be on your laptop, desktop, or mobile device. Um, often, you know, mobile devices holding much more sensitive information than your desktop, for instance. Um, so these are cross-platform often uh, uh, software software in the broadest sense that encrypts your most private communications and asks you for demands uh, often Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency in order to decrypt them uh, or else it will be released to the public or uh, your information will will go out there and and cause reputational damage etc yeah, th thank you. And, and so there's something that like, uh, like a little brief history lesson, right? Like I remember when I got my first ransomware claim in, um, and if we want, we can go into cyber insurance a little bit and why that's actually responding to ransomware in a little in a moment. But it was literally just an automated like script, it would lock the hard drive. And then you would send payment to a Bitcoin address of a couple hundred bucks. And then the script, once that, you know, read the transaction on the blockchain, it would then unencrypt and you go about your day, right? Um, since then, ransomware has become a global epidemic, um, costing billions and billions of dollars a year, right? Um, my, myself, I've seen eight figure demands. Um, it is something that is, can be catastrophic for an organization, right? And even smaller organizations, which is why we're talking today, right? Small businesses are just as impacted by ransomware as larger corporations, in some cases, even more so. And there's a reason for that. Um, ransomware threat actors are, you know, they're, they're luck based attackers, right? Like they're looking for, um, you know, some type of access to a network. They don't necessarily care what network it is. Like, yes, you might have spear phishing or, you know, attempts to encrypt larger companies, but really it's, hey, who can we get access to and how much money we can get from them? So, I mean, maybe it'd be helpful if Luca, if, if you describe kind of the typical access vectors that you see with ransomware on small businesses? Yeah, absolutely. So like Rich said, they're really just going for the lowest hanging fruit. They don't really care who it is or you know, what business they operate in. There is one uh, caveat to that. Some of these ransomware groups will not um, target uh, 
companies where like if they get into a machine and they see that the language set on that machine is like Russian or um, one of those neighboring countries, the malware actually won't run. So that is like the one uh, caveat. That's not always the case, but that is sometimes. But um, yeah, often, you know, it'll be things like RDP, remote desktop protocol, that are uh, companies leave open on the internet. Um, it's really just general security hygiene can really protect against a lot of these attacks. And often they're automated. Um, they're not like looking for a specific company. They're just looking across the internet, you know, spraying attacks and whatever comes back positive is who they go after. Yeah, just to expand on that, uh, you know, the IPs, for instance, uh, you mentioned that they would whitelist certain uh, countries if they had, they geolocate an IP to be within that country. And that's not necessarily because it's a state-sponsored malware attack. It might just be a ransomware group within a country, say a Russian-based ransomware group, um, that doesn't want to get in trouble with their local authorities. But Russia doesn't have any problem with uh, their own ransomware groups attacking uh, companies within, you know, the U.S., for instance. So, yeah, it doesn't mean to you know mean to imply that they're necessarily state actors, but they are. They're under the protector and the, the protect the, the protective force of of a, a nation, for instance. Yeah, you can actually find videos on YouTube of like Russian ransomware groups like in Red Square and they're like Ferraris and Lambos. Like literally like ransomware threat actor Lamborghinis like just doing burnouts in the middle of Moscow. Um, and because it's, it's somewhat of a cash cow, right? And it was interesting because, um, you know, and, and we'll talk about a little bit more, you know, small businesses and things, but we actually saw a decrease in ransomware severity and frequency when the Ukrainian conflict started. And so I actually used to work at Coalition, and Coalition is probably one of the largest providers of cyber insurance to small and medium enterprises, um, to the point where, I mean, at, at the time, I think they had like 30,000 policies. So we were getting five to 10 ransomware claims in a week, okay, post-COVID. Um, it dropped to zero, like literally overnight, February 24th. Like it was the most mind-blowing thing, right? And the reason that being is the hackers started fighting amongst themselves. If you're familiar with the Conti group, it basically splintered because you had Ukrainian actors there and Russian actors, and they started fighting, um, which is a side point. It's really interesting. Um, a security researcher apparently hacked Conti um, and released all of their like private logs and contact information, and it's been translated into English. You can actually search it and read it. It's incredible. And I say security researcher like this because I'm pretty sure the guy was just a Ukrainian who worked for Conti. And he's like, oh, you guys are going to fight for Russia. All right, I'm going to disclose all your shit, right? So, and, and, but at the same time, it's an incredible insight into what they're looking for, what they're trying to do, and who they're trying to attack. You know, some ransomware threat actor groups, they won't go after hospitals like CLOP supposedly says that they won't hit, hit healthcare entities or things like that. Um, I've actually seen one where they encrypted a, a cancer um, health like company and we wrote and we're like, hey, this is a cancer health company. Like, oh, here's the decryption key, sorry, right? Uh, but they're not they're not good people though. Okay, these are not good people. But, you know. Klopp the, being one of these Russian based entities. Right, and, and so, you know, the, you know, we saw this decrease in severity and frequency in my opinion, due to the Ukrainian conflict. But that has since, like, gone away. Like, over 2023, we've seen a massive uptick versus 2022. Um, I thought it was interesting. It also started happening Q1 this year. Um, from what I, what I read somewhere is apparently Russian military contracts are typically a year. So, and the Russians are very big on contracts. So I, you know, again, my conjecture is, is that you had a lot of Russian hackers that were working for the Russian military for a year, their contract was up and it's like, all right, we have to go encrypt the United States businesses to make some money. Um, so ransomware is a big threat. It's a big threat for small and medium enterprises because of, you know, who do you think has better and more sophisticated cybersecurity controls? Fortune 100 company or your mom and pop accounting shop or whatnot, right? Um, I had one claim where it was a smaller business, only maybe about 20 million in revenue a year, which believe it or not is a small business. Um, they had an open RDP and at Coalition, they actually will scan 
like an outside in scan and we'll, and we'll go over that when we talk about things that companies can do to kind of keep themselves safe so for, from for context just uh, explain what an open RDP is so, uh, RDP being remote desktop protocol and uh, an open port open access to remote desktop uh, uh, on, on their clients right thank you and yeah. that's a really good point um, we're, you know, cyber insurance and cybersecurity is very similar to like the military. So we're, we have all these acronyms and things like that. So <laughs> if anybody doesn't understand something we're saying, just raise your hand and be like English, please. Um, but it was interesting because this was a, s a smaller company and we were ac we actually notified them six times that you have an open remote desktop protocol on your network and they didn't do anything. And so I get a call from them. Oh, hey, um, our entire network's been encrypted. And I looked at our scans and I was like, Hey, did you, you're John Smith, right? Yes. Did you receive these six emails? Yeah. Okay. Uh, why didn't you close this, this RDP? And the person goes to me, he sighs and, and he says, well, our office president didn't want to learn another password. So we kept this open for him. Um, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the issues with small and medium enterprises, right? Because you don't have kind of the corporate controls in place that you otherwise might. Um, and hopefully what we, if you guys have any war stories, we're going to get through those because I think war stories are fun because, you know, if you, if you don't laugh, you're going to cry kind of thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, outside of like RDP or, um, you know, open ports to, and, and what, and a lot of people don't know this, maybe Luca or, or William, you can discuss like how you can search for that type of information on the web. Because mm -hmm. from my understanding, and I'm not a techie person, I've just, you know, stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. But, like, you can actually search for this stuff. Like, say, hey, port 3830 on the internet, Show press it. a button, and it will search. Sorry. Show, Show, Shodan is the search engine for uh, many of these things. It's a kind of a internet of things slash um, open ports uh, uh, versions of software uh, also search also engine. Binary Edge. Shodan. Yeah. And then also Binary Edge is one as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, can you guys? Sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, do you guys want to just go in and like just kind of explain like how it is because it's like it's weird how easy it is to do this. Uh, sure. Um, how I imagine someone does this is they use Shodan to see um, the. Basically, any port that you access on the internet has a header, um, and it'll say you connect to a, a port. Maybe it's a uh, eighty eighty or something on a on a web on a, on a server, and that reports back, "Hey, I'm a server. I'm running this software." Um, sometimes it doesn't report that much, which is good. Uh, it doesn't report exactly what it's running, but sometimes it does, and then it'll. Um, you know, then then hackers will attempt to use the default username and password uh, for for that service, and if that works, then you then have access to say remote desktop on a server. Um, so you can use Shodan, for instance, to see to see what exact IP addresses, which is your address on the internet, um, uh, are running what software and then try it. Um, if you're a hacker, you'll try, you know, to access a remote desk that you see, you search for via Shodan, um, what servers are running, you know, uh, this remote desktop software, uh, and then uh, just, just hit each one of them and see which actually uh, give you access via the remote, the, default password yeah so just like he mentioned uh shodan and then binary edge which is another company that coalition owns they scan the whole internet and then you can just search and search through their scans and kind of see what they found and um that's part of kind of also what we do offer at coalition is we're constantly if you were to get a policy with, with us we're constantly scanning your assets and he mentioned these um i should say too a lot of other entities do this as well yeah. right like if, you know like coalition a lot but you know this is not a sales pitch okay no, it's not um and not not that you were thinking it was no, going no. to be but you know just keep that in mind too and we're more than happy to tell you all if you guys have any questions specific to if you're, there, there's any business owners here or employees of um 
you know, small businesses and you do have cyber insurance questions, happy to answer those as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that's kind of the attacker's perspective there. When you're scanning, when, like insurance companies are scanning their policyholders to see what kind of products that they have online, that's exactly what attackers are doing. And that's how they're finding their targets, right? And they're looking for specific things, the low hanging fruit and stuff like that. And that's also what the insurance companies are looking for, hopefully so that you can fix these. And usually they're um, easy things, but like Rich mentioned, it's not always ve very easy to get people to fix these things. Right, and that's like the age old question if we have any people in ITIS, right? Like, what's the business use case for this? And it's like, I don't know, maybe to keep the company up and running, that's the business use case, <laughs> right? Like I literally had one insured tell me once, um, oh yeah, this was on the roadmap for Q3 next year. I'm like, this is MFA for your email address. You have like 50 people on your tenant. Like this is like plug and play. Like why is this something? Like, oh, well, they want us to concentrate on the sales system. It's like, all right, well, you didn't have MFA. So an attacker gained access to a trusted email account, sent out a downloadable link to another party within the organization. And now you're ransomware and your sales system is down for two weeks. Right. So, you know, and, and maybe I'll just touch a little bit on like why ransomware is, is so expensive and dangerous. And. I think William or Luca talked about this as well. Do you prefer Bill or William? Uh, Bill or William, whatever. Okay. Um, not not Billy. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, <laughs> Never Billy. <laughs> but so the, the 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 thing about ransomware is it, it's called like cyber extortion, right? Everyone knows about the encryption of data, but um, Conti was actually one of the groups that um, started doing what I call, uh, call secondary extortion, right? Which which is data exfiltration and data publication. Right. And so a lot of times now, um, specifically post COVID, because everyone had to rush to kind of increase their security controls, we're actually seeing a lot better um, uh, data backups and things like that with companies. So we don't really have as much of a need to pay for encryption or um, decryption. Uh, but what will happen is it will be like, okay, well, we have 10 gigabytes of your data and we're going to publish this on the dark web or, you know, on the Once main web. Us. Right. And if you don't, you know, your, your business is going to be ruined. Right. And so that's a very powerful argument, especially for companies that are worried about, you know, maintaining their relationships with their customers and vendors, especially small and medium enterprises. Now yeah. we're also seeing, sorry, real quick. Now we're also seeing a third, we'll call a third extortion, right? A third level of extortion where not only will they try to encrypt, but then also take the data, but now they'll actually start a harassment campaign. Okay. So I've had threat actors reach out to the spouses of CEOs, chief executive officers, things like that and say, Hey, um, you have a daughter, her name's Sandra. She goes to this school. Uh, we're going to kill her if you don't pay this ransom. Now me sitting there, I can say, hey, this Russian person's not going to come to Peoria, Illinois and kill your daughter. OK, like I know this is very scary, but this is just not going to happen. OK, it's just nothing. But when you get, you know, angry Russian, Eastern European sounding people yelling at you like it, it upsets people. Right. And so we've had to. So when you're dealing with that, especially as a small and medium enterprise, a small business, that can be very scary. Right. And so and it takes it from kind of an objective analysis of do I pay the ransom or do I not pay the ransom into kind of more of a subjective one of, OK, I need to protect my family. Right. I need to protect my business, not just necessarily make it a pecuniary like a monetary transaction. Yeah. And, and uh, a lot of the exploits that I've, we've seen, a lot of the, the vulnerabilities that we've seen for small businesses are, have come from, you know, services that they use. So one of the big instances of malware or, uh, or ransomware that we've seen this year specifically uh, has been uh, uh, Forta's uh, Go Anywhere. Uh, and Forta's Go Anywhere uh, is a uh, media file transfer as a service. Uh, you know, and it allows file transfer in, in, in a, in a uh, streamlined fashion. And it is something that you buy as a small business. And so they are providing a product, but there's an exploit that was found in January this year that uh, was able to exfiltrate, exfiltrate as in like garner, get data from customers of Forda uh, via their Go Anywhere product. Um, you know, via the admin console that you had this product that allowed you to transfer files efficiently and the admin console uh, had a vulnerability in it and 
because of that, 130 organizations were uh, exploited. Uh, and this is uh, the CLOP ransomware group in Russia that we've mentioned before. So this is a number of businesses uh, from large to small, you know, mostly uh, medium size or large businesses. But um, you've seen, you know, medical service providers being targeted as well. Um, and as you mentioned in CLOP and instance, you know, they, they uh, will stop it if they are told that, hey, this is a medical business, don't do that. And then they're just like, oh, okay. Because right. of some random reason. But um, Brightline was one of them, uh, which is a mental services provider uh, and, um, and others. Um, that was a, you know, a, a big one that's affected a large slew of businesses because of the prevalence of this product. So it's not just what their, their own security infrastructure that's on the line, but any product that they use because that the data that they uh, are sending through that is, um, you know, is, is the, the crown jewels. And they're able to, you know, a ransomware group is able to get that via a third party service. Yeah, that, that's a great point, right? Because you, you, you're not only responsible for, from a ransomware threat perspective, your own computer systems, you also need to take uh, in consideration every company you do business with, right? And so, you know, something I always like to say is that, you know, as defenders, you have to be perfect. And as attackers, they just have to be lucky. And some people disagree with me on that. Um, but, you know, I see it time and time again where it's like, all right, we did everything right. We had everything in control, but we had this trusted vendor, um, like for instance, Move It. I don't know if people are familiar with that. It was also done by CLOP. It was also a file transfer protocol. This threat actor group, CLOP, was was you know had um, access to this vulnerability for like two years, okay? And they just sat there and just in ingressed data after data after data before they went live with like publication, right? And so. You know, a lot of, you know, and, and I look at it from a perspective of, you know, what are your risks as a, a person that gets hit with ransomware, right? You have the cyber extortion, you have, uh, there's personally identifiable information, you have to do notification and credit monitoring to your customers, right? But there's also a class action risk. All 50 states have a privacy regulatory framework that allows for a private right of action, typically to sue for, you know, a privacy violation, right? Well, in the MoveIt situation, they were using a trusted industry-leading secure file transfer protocol to transfer sensitive information. What could a person do other than that, right? But now they have a ransomware risk or a pu data publication risk, um, even though they did everything the right way. Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering if you'd ever come in contact where the, the bad actors have asked not basically asked, hey, would you like to put us under contract? Oh, yeah. No, we, so, so I, I've gotten that quite a bit, and usually it's a security researcher that reaches out yeah. and says, oh, I found this bug on your website, and it allowed me access to all of your corporate information. Um, you need to pay me $100,000 or I'm going to disclose it. And it's like, all right, bro, like that's kind of extortion-y, right? Like, you know, because typically there's – bug bounty programs and other things like yeah. that to where you can take advantage of that if yeah, you're there's true. responsible disclosure and then there's that right right <laughs> yeah. and, and the thing is is a lot of times like you pay it right because you know you can't you know and, and that's the thing that we can discuss too like and maybe in a little bit we'll ask everyone to pay or not to pay right but you know that happens all the time um and sometimes i think it's done in good faith um a lot of times i think it's not I only ask because uh, I haven't been in IT very long, but I've had been involved in three instances for a company that has had to deal with ransomware. And I just thought that was kind of odd because the third instance that we dealt with was they were just like, oh, yeah, we found this vulnerability in your system. Uh, you pay us this, we'll put you under contract, and this will right. never happen again. And I, I yeah. just thought that was odd. Yeah, no, it, it's <laughs> wild. And, and I mean, because so, and, and I wonder if it's like a psychological thing thank where you. these criminals, oh, no, thank you for the question. Um, they're trying to like make themselves sound good to themselves. Like, no, we're not thieves. We're, you know, security professionals, security right? Yeah. Security researchers. 
Yeah, we're yeah. you know, and it, it's it's like we're it's like and, you. and it's often like, like just like right? a protection, protection rack, racket. racket. You know, in the mafia instance, uh, you do get protection if you actually pay up. That's how they guarantee safety. Um, if you you know actually give in to the extortion, then your data is safe until it's not right until some dot you know time down the line when uh, the business goes their their own business goes out of business and they decide to re- release everything to um, another third party uh, uh, vendor of, of malware or ransomware that that may not be as uh, accountable <laughs> as they are it's kind of a interesting and, and the mafia business model worked for a reason like yes i'm going to give you 50% of my uh, earnings uh, for a protection racket uh, fee, and I will actually be safe from because it you are be safe from you. Yeah, from you. I'm going to protect <laughs> you from myself. And yeah. another thing I just wanted to mention, uh, Rich, we were talking about Move It and how it's a kind of industry leading secure file transfer protocol. But even after that was published, right, and ransomware cases started appearing. There was no fix. They hadn't released a software fix, right? So the, the fix was take it offline. And it's like, what are you supposed to do if you're a business that relies on this service? Right. So it's a pretty tricky, like, it's a pretty tricky thing to navigate for these small businesses. Yeah, and it's why ransomware is so, like, monetarily, like, you know, good for the threat actors, right? Like, because it hits everything and, and really puts you in a bind. Um, and it, and you know, going back to the, kind of the security researcher thing, is you know I've been involved in a lot of like ransom negotiations, and a lot of times they'll take that tack, like, hey, we're just here to help you, okay? It's not our fault that your you know IT and IS you know controls were terrible, okay? But we're doing you a service for one million dollars, right? And then it's it's kind of neat because a couple of times we've actually gotten after action reports from the threat actor. Like legit, like, you know, security, like reports like, hey, yeah, we were able to access these ports and, you know, these IP addresses and these are our recommended fixes and blah, 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 all this stuff. And you're like, okay, like, that's cool, I guess. I mean, thanks for breaking in my house and then telling me to fix the window, you know, but, um, you know, so it, it is very interesting to see, you know, the different threat actor groups, how they, they work and handle different things. So now a lot of the, the, you know, and we'll go in a little bit more about how to protect your company, but I just want to get to like to pay or not to pay, okay? And I'll let you guys go first. But do you think a company should be able to pay a ransom or not pay a ransom? And this is going to be something that's going to be a very important um, issue going forward. Some states have passed laws saying that municipality, municipality governments and organizations cannot pay ransoms. Okay, and this is an issue. Uh, look at the city of Baltimore. Okay, they got hit by a ransomware attack. The ransom request, the extortion payment, I want to say was like, like one hundred fifty thousand dollars. They're like, no, we're not paying it. So they spent thirty million dollars to remediate the ransomware event. Now, is that worthwhile? See, see from my perspective, I, I think that as someone who from a privileged perspective can say never pay the ransom no that only gives them what they want well you know actually if they are in a position where they can threaten your children if they if that actually is a credible threat then who am i to say uh, don't pay them because sometimes that is a credible threat sometimes that is something that they have the ability to do uh and uh i business is on the line as well yeah cases and and I and I don't want to uh, to say never do something because it's all up to the individual. I think that it's as a uh, you know as a general principle, I agree that no one um, that that having a hard line against ransoms uh, should be the general principle because then they don't have any power to hold against anyone. But then again, sometimes the threat is so large that. You just need to do it, and that sucks. Right. Yeah, no, it does. And, I mean, you know, I've been on the phone with a lot of company owners and senior stakeholders that literally in tears. You know, this was my grandfather's business. We just went paperless six months ago, and now the entire business is encrypted. What do we do? You know, um, and I want to say, hey, we don't want to pay these criminals. But at the same time, like, I, you know, that's one of the reasons I enjoy doing what I do with cyber insurance is because, you know, unlike other lines of insurance, especially in the professional liability context, 
like you can make a difference right away, right? Like I can get a call and say, oh, you're encrypted. Okay, well, you know what? This is something that's covered under your policy. Let's handle it. Get the proper security people in place and get the proper um, lawyers in place and things like that. And you can assist kind of from minute zero. Now, the, the counterpoint to your argument, though, is a lot of companies just want to pay it just to pay it right they're like oh hey yeah we don't want those like 500 lines of the excel spreadsheet on the dark web it's like all right bro like no one cares all right <laughs> like you're a small accountant shop in omaha nebraska right like no one cares you know no but we need to pay the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, right and so there's a fine line of um how do you manage the expectations of a company and the kind of subjective thought and fear when dealing with ransomware against what might be objectively best for the company um, in a vacuum. P.S. Uh, check on the guy that ate the Reaper. You okay? Yeah. Good. You need, you, need some, you need some water? Is he still pushing those Reapers? Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want, can't, want, want me to get a cup of water? No, I'm fine. Oh, okay, all right. I'm going to feel it later. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, go for yeah. it. <laughs> Sorry, for the people that aren't in the know, he, he ate a, a Reaper pepper before the beginning of this. So I just want to check it on him. I'm glad it wasn't Mushroom. Anyways, <laughs> so I'm a front-end developer. Um, I work front-end with a web systems, API layers, even back to the database layer, .NET, uh, Node.js, all of it. What's something on my end when I'm building something, when I'm developing something, that I can do to you know, reduce ransomware <coughs> attacks in my systems, you know, and kind of do my part to redu you know, defend against them? Just develop with security in mind. Just make sure that you're following best practices when it comes to not making web applications vulnerable to SQL injection attacks mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, exfiltration of data, et cetera, because those are going to be the points which will turn into uh, cracks, which will then turn into uh, possible exploitation by a threat actor. That's yep. my suggestion. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with him. Um, Developing with security in mind is definitely the way to go because oftentimes adding security after the fact is much more difficult and more expensive too. So if you can start with that in the back of your mind when you're developing, it'll save you a lot of time and money and keep you more secure in the long run. Yeah. And I would say too, like, know what, know what you're putting in your code, right? Like, look at Log4j, right? Like, it ended up kind of in the grand scheme of things being somewhat of a nothing burger, but like, all of this code was built upon this thing that was basically maintained by one guy in like the Midwest, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you're using, and again, I'm not too technical, but you know, if you're using different, you know, programs or, you know, different kind of pre-created solutions to help you do what you do, just vet it, right? Make sure you understand what it is, make sure you're familiar with the company that does it or whatnot, right? Because again, you know, you have, you know, unauthorized access to your network, right, via remote desktop protocol or open ports or whatever. But then you also have that risk of using a different platform or a different product that, you know, if you don't control what, what's in there, then that, that could be an issue too. I was a freelance web developer when I got my first cert, which was a Offensive Securities uh, uh, OSCP, which is Offensive Security Certified Professional. It's a pretty low cost cert uh, that teaches you a lot of things about web application security and, 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 and getting involved in things like OWASP, which is a web application security uh, 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 community. And those things will kind of teach you the basics on how to develop with security in mind. Uh, and uh, I can't what? recommend them enough. What was it called again? Uh, there's the Offensive Security Certified Professional uh, Certification, uh, OSCP, and um, that's the creators of the Kali Linux. Uh, uh, ah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so they uh, run a cert program, um, which is low cost. Uh, for me, I was a freelance web developer at the time. I couldn't afford, you know, uh, you know the high cost certs. Um, but uh, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, just having that, uh, those, those in a wasp, for instance, O W A S P O W A A A O W A S P. Um, just kind of like working on kind of offensive hacks of web applications yourself teaches you how they're vulnerable. 
the and hacker's mindset. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. just thinking about how somebody can use what you're writing maliciously, mm-hmm. or like against you every once in a while while you're programming. It's it's not always like some some crazy like uh, security measure you have to put in there that's super complex. It's usually just the basics, yeah. you know. So just having that mindset and checking in every once in a while, and just doing simple things can can help. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, do we have it? Um, so, thinking about ransomware and and how you know, because we have about twenty four minutes left, but I really want to get into how small businesses can protect themselves. And so, I come at things from a little bit of a reactive environment because I get noticed of a cyber incident and the our insured seeks coverage for the damages or assistance with remediating the incident, right? And so the top three things in my mind, and then I'll let you guys get a little bit more technical, is one, you know, you want to make sure that you don't have open access to your network, right? Seems pretty, like, easy, right? But, again, small businesses, they might not have the technical knowledge or know how to actually do that. Um, A lot of times they're using platforms or programs just kind of purchased off the web and configured by themselves. So obviously, you know, no remote access access into your um, network. Two, have viable backups, right? And this is a big one and something that I'm sure a lot of you know already, but if you don't, shout it from the rooftops, test your backups, okay? I had one insured called me up like, yeah, we're not worried about this as a construction company. Yeah, we have on-prem physical backups. We had cloud storage-based backups. We even have tape backups. I'm like, whoa, you guys are good. Well, guess what? Tape backups haven't been updated in two years. Cloud backups were not air gap, so they got encrypted. Um, <laughs> and the digital on-prem backups hadn't been uh, backed up for like six months. Right. And so there is like three backup technologies that just failed. Right. And I got a frantic call, you know, two days later saying, nope, actually, we need to we need to pay the ransom. And we ended up paying almost one point five million dollars on that. Right. So you have have to have to test your backups. Right. Um, And then the third thing is not really like a prevention. It's more of like a mitigation. Right. And, you know, obviously there's two people here that work in cyber insurance. Cyber insurance is a great risk mitigation tool for ransomware, okay? And the reason I say that is because a lot of companies do not either have the technical knowledge or expertise to deal with a ransomware event, um, and neither do their IT consultants, okay? The amount of times I've seen um, MSPs or whatever try to do incident response and just completely muck it up is, is way too many. All right, and so you need kind of a a lifeline to those consultants that actually deal with this on a daily basis. And, you know, the thing is, is most cyber insurance policies will pay uh, for a cyber extortion payment, right? And I know large companies that can't afford a million or two million dollars, right? And liquid funds that need to be paid within five days, right? Cyber insurance policies offer that. Now, there's a key term here, right, for this risk mitigation that's gonna be very helpful. If you do get cyber insurance for your business, you want to make sure that your cyber extortion coverage or your ransomware coverage is a pay on behalf coverage. Okay? It's either going to be pay on behalf or it's going to be reimbursement or indemnify. Okay? Reimbursement and indemnify means that you have to pony up the payment, the insurance company is going to pay you after. Okay? Pay on behalf means the insurance company will actually pay on your behalf. All right? And so those are the top three things in my mind. Uh, I'll throw it to you guys for any technical or anything else you want to add. Yeah, I would honestly say a lot of the same things. Um, reduce your attack service, right? So we talked about, you know, scanning the internet and Shodan and Binary Edge where you can, like, search to see what's on the internet and search people's IPs. You don't want to be showing up there, right? Take these things down, put them behind VPNs, things like that. Uh, Enable and enforce... Have MFA on your VPN, please. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Enable and enforce uh, multi-factor authentication. That's definitely helpful as well. And then backups. <laughs> Test the backups. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things about security is that you're not trying to build this impenetrable force that no one can get into because if somebody really wants to get in, there's, there's going to be a way in. What you want to do is you don't want to be that low-hanging fruit Right? You want to do just enough security so that it's not worth their time to come after you. And 
the thing is, if you if they do come after you and and you do get taken over by ransomware, how quickly can you get back up and running? Because that can also reduce uh, the hit that it takes on you and the cost. So test your backups and make sure they work. And uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thinking of it from from the perspective of uh, if you get hit by ransomware, then how quickly can you get back up? Um, one of the things is how much data is out there and how valuable that is. I think that one of the, you know, uh, if you have data that is very salient to a hacker and you really, really, really don't want that data to get out there, then you're going to be more likely to pony up the cash. And so data minimization is a big part of that. Uh, making sure that uh, if you need access to the customers, for instance, the, if the customers, the, the list of your customers isn't very valuable, but their addresses is, then, and you only use those addresses to send out mailings once a year, then, for instance, you can store their data in a like out in cold storage in a uh, offline manner uh, if they don't need to actually have that available online, uh, store that in an air-gapped manner, for instance, in a way that is not readily accessible to a hacker if they hack your database. So if your customer list may be exfiltrated uh, and compromised, then their addresses aren't compromised because you're storing that you know, off-site or on an air-gapped machine somewhere else. Um, well, that can do a lot in your calculation of whether you want to pony up for the uh, ransom, and uh, and that'll that'll make the the data that the hackers get a lot less valuable. Sir, hey, um, so I'm a I'm a pen tester, and um, you know, so I only really get to a company after they've been extorted, and what I've seen is usually the threat actor is. It, it's usually on Active Directory, and they're using and they're getting the ntds.dit file to get all the you know passwords. Um, but for a small business that might not be on Active Directory, and there's no SMB shares or anything like, what are the trends used by threat actors to take over a small business if there's not that you know you know one hand reaching? So everything? W we've seen about greater than 50% of all ransomware claims start with email phishing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, yeah, they don't have as complex as of a network and there's not, you know, whatever, but they get trusted access to an email account and then can parlay that into downloadable link for malware or something like that. But uh, as far as the technical stuff, I'd defer to you guys. Yeah, or, you know, as we said, like third parties that are storing information, uh, you know, CR CRMs that are uh, off-site that are storing information. And then via the CRM, they have their customer data stored with a third party and then all of their uh, clients get get uh, are vulnerable to attack. Didn't we see a bunch of um, like firewall issues with Fortinet? Yeah, Fortinet's uh, VPN service uh, had, a, had a lot of problems this year. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of funny. You buy this product that's supposed to make you more secure, and that is actually how the attackers get in. Right. So that's kind of a common thing that we see, and, and that's... There's been a lot of vulnerabilities that have come out, and a lot of attackers have targeted those systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and two, like, um, even with very unsophisticated network environments, I had a ransomware claim where we ended up paying $750,000 because um, the threat actor got access to a, a Gmail account and Google Docs and basically changed the password. Mm -hmm. And after they, and so what they did is they changed the password, they deleted all the information, okay, made sure that it couldn't be recovered. And then we're like, all right, well, we have all this information from your business. It was a design, architectural design firm. Don't ask me why their entire life was in a Google Doc. But, um, and they were on the phone with Google, and they're like, hey, can you revert this back? And they're like, yeah, we can, but it's probably going to take like two months. So, you know, I mean, being a pen test, that, that's a cool job, number one. Yeah. Number two, um, you know, it's like, you know, it, I did a hacking 201 last year, and one of the people there was was a, a you know a, a gray hat or white hat like pen tester and he would tell stories how he would just walk into places and insert a USB into a computer, right? So the smaller the business and the less sophisticated the, the network infrastructure doesn't I mean it can help keep you safe but yeah. if if you know if you're unlucky enough to 
fall victim, like you're stuck. Yeah. Active Directory and and SMB shares are are a huge threat, you know, uh, but huge threats are more common than they, I think that like would what I would look at is what's uh, being listed on exploits DB and seeing uh, what allows remote code execution, for instance, uh, what Metasploit modules are being uh, actively developed and, and added to the Metasploit framework and see uh, via those uh, what um, uh, are large threats to, to a, a small business. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so I want to touch on the discussion of the importance of backups because I think traditionally like that's been the answer to this You're worried about ransomware have an air gap backup but today with both the heavy emergence of third-party managed storage so you're not running it on-prem and also GDPR where you may be required to delete customer records like how would you respond to an insured who says I can't do a full system backup for either technical or legal reasons. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, something that we've come around, I mean, especially with the advent of CCPA, which has created a right to deletion in the United States, right? And so um, really it, it's, you know, you have to work with what you got, mm -hmm. right? And so in a situation like that, like, can you encrypt at rest, right? Can you have an air gap solution where it's like, all right, well, I can't, you know, necessarily recreate a full backup, but I can say, all right, I'm going to sort, you know, I'm going to put my sensitive information over here and limit access to it, right? Things like that. Um, but, you know, in the ransomware context, you know, GDPR and other privacy regulatory frameworks are, are a big motivator too, because when the data is accessed, then you essentially have a notification obligation. So, um, but to your point, you know, I mean, if you can't, if there's a, a you know, a legitimate business use case for not having that, then you don't have it. And then at that point, that's when I would say, okay, well, if you can't, you know, obviously not create this impregnable environment, but if, if you can't, you know, have really good backups on information that you need to use, well, then I would probably make sure that either A, can you change your business practices to allow for those backups, or B, have a really robust cyber insurance policy to pay for any ransomware. And the, the only thing I would add to that is that uh, zero knowledge backup systems are extremely uh, valuable in that you can simply encrypt a you know, the information that you want encrypted before you send it to the backup service. And um, the, if they do not require you, well, if they if they do require you to send them unencrypted uh, back, you know, uh, backups uh, information, then then you probably shouldn't be using them first of all. Um, but uh, you know, if they're only storing information that uh, is encrypted in the first place, um, there's various services just uh, for a home user like uh, Spider Oak One and. Uh, and uh, Jungle Disk uh, has uh, actual uh, uh, encrypted uh, backups uh, that are, and then they themselves, the third party, doesn't have access to your uh, private data as well. Thank you. Hey, uh, you guys have gone over a lot of different measures you can take to protect yourself. I, I was just kind of wondering if you could rank them from some of the cheapest or easiest to implement to some of the more expensive or difficult to implement solutions. I would say MFA on your email accounts, right? Number one, um, and on the same time, if you're using like Microsoft 365 or even on-prem exchange, like turn on higher level auditing, right? Because a lot of times, you know, if you do get breached, you want to be able to see how, and from an email compromise perspective, if you only have three days or seven days of logs, it's not very helpful. Um, but phishing trainings, right. phishing yeah, trainings. Definitely. Yeah, just totally. have your employees know that this is something that looks suspicious. This is an example of something that looks suspicious. This is what to look out for. They'll, they'll their red flags will will uh, you know their red flag detectors will will be uh, much better for it. Yeah, no, and, and that's a really good point because um, you know I always see these claims that come in. It's like, oh, well, how did this happen? We got fished and blah blah blah. blah. And it's like, well, it's never happened before and it's not going to happen again. It's like, yeah, but it happened once. You know what I mean? And a lot of places have very lax guidelines until they get 
smacked, so to speak, right? So, yeah, I think employee education and, and kind of also educating higher level individuals as well, um, because a lot of the worst claims I've seen have actually come from hacks of the C-suite, right? And so, yeah, it's great. Like your frontline employees are getting phishing training, you know, twice a month and blah, 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 blah. But then the CEO's email gets hacked and, you know, they have the keys to the castle. But I would say um, after that, you know, really it's, you know, depending upon your network, right? Like how extensive it is, what type of protocols and platforms you're using. But uh, I don't know, do you guys have anything as far as cost? I was gonna say the same thing with MFA is probably the easiest to, to start with. Yeah, and then and also close access to, you know, the network from the outside, right? Unless it's permissioned access. And ensuring your employees have devices which are getting security updates, um, and using best practices with, in terms of you know their private devices, um, if their email is particularly sensitive, not having it on their phones, uh, for instance. Yeah, Kroll, um, Kroll just got hacked yeah. via uh, a, a phishing, a, a spear phishing attempt via text or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Like or a sim, a SIM card attack. Right. right. Yeah. And, and, swim, swap, and swap they're, they're the managers in. of like the BlockFi, like cryptocurrency bankruptcy. Um, and they're also an incident response provider, uh, but an employee had uh, their phone SIM swapped and was able to use that to get around MFA to get access to their email. Yeah, and similar to what Bill mentioned, just like updating, using the security patches and updating all of your software like all the time is really important and That's a really a easy point. way to kind of like stay secure. Yeah, managed uh, software uh, infrastructure is something that is extremely valuable and to make sure that your employees have updates turned on and, and don't install just random shit on the internet. <laughs> Maybe don't install that, you know, uh, candy, you know, crush candy app on your work phone. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Hello. I got lucky. We, uh, my organization, a small nonprofit. We got lucky with our first brush with ransomware. Uh, we were co-located with the city of Atlanta when they got hit. And a couple of our computers, including mine, got hit. But we were all on SharePoint. And we were up later that day. Um, so how do I, and, then the, and I'm just thinking, that's just dumb luck. So how do we, using SharePoint, OneDrive, those types of, of cloud storage is our primary method. How do we protect ourselves? Then we do have a third party um, a backup program, but we don't really have a network to speak of of our own uh, that's built out. So how, you know, like we get it in um, a NAS or how would we do that? Yeah, well, I, I can tell you that you're not the only one that that's happened to. Um, I've had multiple insureds who um, were completely dead in the water and someone had uploaded everything to OneDrive or Dropbox or whatever, right? And so cloud, a cloud storage backup solution is an arrow in your quiver, right? Um, there, you know, there are some security issues with that. You need to make sure that, you know, the access to it is permissioned and you have MFA on it. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can't That's credential perfect. stuff your way into, you know, the keys to the castle kind of thing. Um, but as far as you know, other solutions, how big of a how big is your like? Less than twenty people. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, one of the things is that any third party that has access to your data, just a simple search of uh, their security history can go a long way. Uh, knowing if a service takes the security of their customers cavalier. Uh, cavalierly, or if they take it seriously, uh, and I don't—I don't mean the uh, always state, stated statement. We take your data and privacy very seriously, because <laughs> that's yeah. something that is a dime a dozen. Um, I think that uh, you know the actual uh, data breach history and uh, and also response to data breaches. Mm -hmm. Hey, it yeah. happens. And if a company is responsible with disclosing to their customers that this has happened and here are the mitigating steps uh, to take, then that's 
uh, important. They're being upfront with their customers and, and making sure that they, uh, the worst doesn't happen. And so I think that looking into the security of any third party uh, service that you use is, is, goes a long way. Okay. Yeah, and honestly, OneDrive might be the perfect solution for your organization too. So, okay. yeah, I instituted a vendor um, kind of audit policy. So anyone who wants to use like, you know, ClickUp or Asana or anything, they have to go through me, and then I rate them on a kind of a rubric uh, before they can use That's it. That's great. Yeah. You were talking about some of the benefits of having a insurance um, <coughs> policy for ransomware, but I'm curious about the market trends where insurance companies are clearly in the market of making business, making money, and if every single person is being paying and every um, ransomware so, is increasing, so where where does the market so, then say, you know, no, I'm not going to insure you because yeah. you're paying out? And, and that's probably a mistake on my end. Like, it's it's a pan on ransomware, and no one wants to hear all the hundreds of times we haven't paid it and just, you know, kind of flicked off the threat actors and went about our day. Um, but I would say we only pay it on around 18% of the claims that come in. Um, and generally, um, cyber insurance historically has been a very profitable line of insurance. It actually didn't um, go into what we would call hard market in insurance, which is when typically is a response to claim activity and premium goes up and it's more, companies are more selective in the risks that they write um, until post COVID. And that was kind of a black swan event in that, you know, you had this rush to everyone needs to work from home and these companies did not have the protocols or applications to keep those that computer networking technology safe, right? Um, so we've actually seen that market harden and then soften. But um, you know, one of the things is, is that there's a ton of entrance into the cyber insurance marketplace, and so all of these other market players are actually, in my opinion, um, making it more competitive for the ultimate like individual or company. Right. Are you seeing um, either law enforcement or federal government coming in with a recommended state of policy in terms of don't pay? Because if you pay, you now encourage the actors to continue on because now there's a business market for it. Right. And if we can get everybody, even though it'd be painful in the short run and long run, if we get everybody not to pay, then the hackers stop. Right. Yeah. So um, yes and no. So as I said earlier, there have been some municipal like states that have said, hey, if you're a municipal government or entity or organization, you're prohibited from paying a ransomware payment. There is no federal prohibition there, um, although there might be some with some, no, it's mandatory notification for DOD contractees. Um, but, you know, the, the big thing is, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult to say don't pay ransom. Um, from a legal like law enforcement perspective because they can't really get involved with the existential crisis of a private company, right? And so I have some close contacts at the FBI and the Secret Service and their whole thing to me is, Rich, we just want data, okay? We don't care if you pay it. It's not illegal to pay it as long as you're complying with any sanctions risk, right? Searching the SDN list, maintaining compliance with OFAC or other um, sanction schemes in other countries, right? It's not technically illegal to do that, right? It's like if someone kidnaps you in Colombia, right? And your family pays the ransom, that's not illegal, right? But their concern is with catching the, the threat actors and to stop and, and to really shut down the kind of internet infrastructure and technology that they're using to, to hit these companies. Um, and I've had the FBI tell them, they don't, we don't care, all right? But we want you to know our IOC, like we want to know the IOCs, uh, in, indicators of compromise, the IP addresses of the attack vetters, command and control systems, things like that, so that we can go out and actually try to capture them and, and um, stop them from doing business. And on the uh, side of uh, CISA, which is the Cybersecurity uh, Information and Security Agency, um, they have been trying to kind of raise the minimum bar of security across the board by uh, you know issuing guidelines to businesses and individuals so that the their uh, information isn't quite so at risk of being compromised in general, uh, and that's kind of their uh, prerogative. It's the basically making sure that uh, the public interest 
uh, you know, in terms of information security, uh, is, is, uh, is, 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 you know, not only maintained, but, uh, but, uh, heightened and, and, uh, they issued, uh, guidelines on IOT recently and, and all sorts of guidelines and, and how to keep information, uh, secure and not, uh, risk our, um, our cybersecurity infrastructure in general. So raising the bar, raising that kind of idea where adding water to the pond uh, makes all boats float uh, higher. Um, that's uh, the prerogative of the federal government in terms of uh, what CISA does at least. Yeah, I think we're out of time, right? Any, any last questions before we? Yes, sir. You said 18% get paid. Well, usually either there's, um, and so for people in the back, he asked 18% eight, of claims there's a ransomware payment. Why don't the others get paid? And typically it's because there's no need for uh, decryption and, and or there was no data exfiltration or the data that was exfiltrated, um, the insured doesn't think it's necessary to keep it from being published. So essentially like, all right, yeah, you had access to our network, but nothing you did actually really hurt us. So we're, we're good to go. Yeah, exactly. And it, in, in some instances, we've actually um, gotten decryption keys from the government uh, law enforcement and been like, hey, don't pay this. We somehow CIA'd us a copy of the decryption keys and you're good to go. Don't forget to rate your panels, please. No. Thank you, Thank guys. you so much. Thank you.